Shabbat Shalom. Isn't it good to be back in the house of the Lord? God was asking me on the way, what are you doing and why, what are you doing? You know, why are you going to synagogue? And, you know, it's kind of a question that I think everybody should ask, ask themselves. Um, Yeah, it's written in scripture that, you know, you work six, rest one, don't forsake the gathering of the believers. Um, and, And my answer was, it's what I'm supposed to do. It's what I'm supposed to do. Um, I'm glad I'm here. I hope you're glad you're here. I don't know if you're glad that I'm here, but God is good. He is the God that gives mercy to people who don't deserve it. It's all us. It's all us. Um, on God's calendar, the biblical calendar, today is the 23rd of Elul. Everybody relate to God's calendar? Does anybody know God's got a calendar? <laughs> All right, somewhere around 15, the 15, 1600s, there was a pope named Gregory, and he kind of rearranged the calendars. They had been the Julian calendar forever, whatever. And I think the United States eventually accepted the Gregorian calendar as a national calendar back in the mid 1700s or something like that. God's calendar has always been there. You know, God sets set His calendar in place, and man tries to come by and rename it, change the meanings of the words, change the months, rename the months. Um, but God never changes. It never changes. And on his calendar that the scriptures say start in the spring, the month of Aviv, I think it's Exodus 12.2, check me on that, 13.4, but Aviv is the first month of, on God's calendar, there are 12 months in God's calendar, somewhere along the way, the, uh, the sun in the orbit of the earth or whatever got out of sync, so it w- instead of even numbered months, um, man had to come back and, and on the Jewish calendar add a 13th month every few years to keep the calendar lined up with God's orbit of the, st- of the moon and the stars. So all that to say, uh, the month of Elul is the month of harvest. Um, one of the, 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 late, the latter harvest. Um, on some calendars, you'll see the month of Elul is the sixth calendar, six months, and some you'll see it's the twelfth month. Um, God's calendar, it's the sixth month. Now, we've, we defer as a body to the, the Hebrew calendar that the Orthodox put out there and they use the civil calendar which is calling um, a little the twelfth month so the the year rolls at the end of the twelfth month on the civil, civil, civil calendar how important is that? Nah, it's, it's kind of nice to keep everything keep peace within Judaism so it's not like we're going to rewrite the calendar and start it over and But whatever, just so you know what God's calendar is. um, In the next month in Tishri, um, um, that's when the High Holy Days come. Um, The fall feast, if you will. You know, there are three feasts in the spring, three feasts in the fall. And the month of Elul is kind of like a time that we have to get ready to prepare for the High Holy Days that are coming up. You know, the first one is uh, Yom Teruah. Um, Not everybody's heard of Yom Teruah. But if you get into Leviticus 23, you'll see that's what God calls it. You know, you'll you'll hear the organized Judaism calls it Rosh Hashanah. Okay, so they say that the Rosh head, Shana year, Rosh Hashanah, 
the head of the year starts in the seventh month. Um, I'm a little confused when somebody says the new year starts in the seventh month. But it's the way it is, you know? So uh, it should drive you to question. You know, when, you, when you're confused, it should make you question what is, what am I reading? What, am, what is the conventional teaching or what is accepted by everybody? You know, they call it Rosh Hashanah because they say it's the, it's the head of the year. But it's not the first of the year. It's not the first of God's year. It's the first of civil year. So, in, so when in Judaism, we'll call it Rosh Hashanah, but in the biblical calendar, it's called Yom Teruah. You lose the meaning of Yom Teruah when you call it Rosh Hashanah. It's okay to call it Rosh Hashanah. Everybody does, right? But biblically, it's Yom Teruah. It's the day of the sounding. Yom Day Teruah sounding. The sounding of the trumpets. In other words, God has on his calendar every year, we're going to come back to this place. I'm going to get your attention on Yom Teruah. And for 10 days, I want you to reflect on you, what you've done, what you can do, what you could have done, and what you did. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, they're called the days of awe, from the first to the tenth. And the, on the tenth day is the Yom Kippur, Yom Day Kippur covering, which is the, day, the only day in the biblical calendar that the high priest goes into the, or went into the Holy of Holies. And he sprinkled blood on the holy seat for a covering for the sins of the people once a year. And they hoped he would come out. <laughs> yeah. God in his mercy, yes, he continued to do that. He continued to do that. So that's, biblically, that's where um, Yom Kippur comes. But it is a day of, day of covering and the covering of the blood. There's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood without the shedding of the innocent blood which God put down as a pattern where the lambs were, were slaughtered morning and evening, morning and evening for the sins of the people. Those lambs didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. Just like Yeshua. Because when he, when he paid that ultimate price, when he became the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist called him, remember that? He didn't say, Behold, a Lamb of God. No, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, the fulfillment of all those promises that God gave and the covering that he, could, he and only his blood could do because it was innocent blood. So we got that coming up. Um, I hope you're preparing for it. And then five days after Yom Kippur comes Sukkot, which is a festival. Um, a joyous festival. Um, it's the tabernacles. It's like, I think, you know, people rename things, right? Um, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and every year we had a homecoming. And all those people that never, ever came, they knew there was going to be food. <laughs> we'll say, if you feed them, they will come. But homecoming was the time of regathering. There's nothing new about that. It's always been there. It's in God's plan. Leviticus 23. Go back to it. Read it. Read it. Read it. And that's why we do, do what we do. There were three, three times a year where all the men gathered. When they were in the land, they'd come to Jerusalem. They'd come to Jerusalem. So we're, we have that season upon us. And I'm reminded that as believers... Um, the marching orders that were given by Yeshua before he left. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Marching orders? Matthew 10, 28, 29. Go ye therefore into all the nations, making disciples. People cut it off right there. He didn't stop there. He said, teaching them to obey whatever I said. He and the Father won what he said. The Father said, because he said he didn't say anything but what the Father said. So it's really simple that if we buy in, if we join the army of God, we become believers, you know, through that new birth, that that's our commission. 
The standing orders is to make disciples, teaching people to obey. And you know, I guess the best sermon is the one that you walk. So if people see you walking in God's ways, it'll be easier to help them understand what walking in God's ways is. It's not about telling people what to do. It's about showing them what to do. Um, We serve a wonderful God. He's the God of all hope. He is the hope of Israel. And uh, I'm just uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm going to read a psalm. Um, The Psalms, the Telahim in Hebrew, uh, it's Israel's hymn book. Uh, The scriptures speak to us. The Psalms speak for us. You know, there were multiple writers. David wrote probably half the Psalms, maybe more. He didn't, he signed about 73 of them. Um, And it's amazing that when you try to put, try to read something in context, that it takes on a different meaning. David's life was not an easy life. I mean, he was called by God at an early age. The Spirit was in him before he went out to do the impossible in the Valley of Elah because that Philistine was bad-mouthing his God. So David, early on, had a calling on his life, and all through his life, it wasn't easy. It was not easy. He had Saul trying to kill him. This was his father-in-law. You know, he, he had his son trying to kill him. Um, he, he led a very tumultuous life, yet he was the king of Israel. And the scriptures say that he was a man after God's own heart. I mean, he's the example for us. People that being a man after God's own heart, he wants to please God. We don't do it all the time, okay. I know, but if we fall, we'll fall forward toward God. And then we'll get back up. But uh, this, this psalm, and I think the next one as well, um, 56 I'm sorry, 57, 57. Um, If you read the the introduction, and if you've got the the first first edition of David Stern's Complete Jewish Bible, it's on page 845. Um, I was always told that a good student brings his textbook to class. Um, If you don't have your textbook with you, uh, you could feel burned right now. I mean, what are you? Are you wasting God's time? Are you coming here to learn? You don't get it without studying it, without marinating in it, without walking it out. So was that a rebuke? Mm, Yeah. (laughs) Look, there are people out there that deserve to be spoon-fed. And I hope you're not one of them. Um, There's an arrogance that comes with that Uh, But there's humility that comes from knowing just who we are in God. That uh, He he is everything, we're nothing. Um, So just take it with a grain of salt. Um, For the leader, set to do not destroy. This is the introduction. This is for the leader, okay? If you're a leader, this is for you whether you're leading your business or leading your family, this is for you. Or whether you're leading your children, this is for you. Uh, it, it, the next words are set to do not destroy. I think if you had a document and you wanted people not to destroy it, you'd write do not destroy on there, right? Maybe that's what David did. I'm just reading and that's what it says. Um, and it's by David. He signed it. And this was, and it's called Amiktam. Now if you 
look at the word mikdam and try to find a meaning for mikdam in Hebrew, it's hard. People say, like, we don't know what that word means. But you determine the use, the meaning of a word by its use. And so I can put a definition on it of mikdam being, this is what I wrote about what I was going through so you can know how I felt at the time. And in context, this was when he fled from Shaul, Saul, King Saul, into the cave of, Ad of Adullam. So you got the context now. He's running for his life. Anybody ever been in that place? Running for your life? Somebody after you with a gun or a knife or something like that? Or an army? And this is what David wrote at the time. Show me favor, God. Show me favor. For in you I have taken refuge. Another version will say, be merciful unto me. Yes, I will find refuge in the shadow of your wings until the storms have passed, until the calamities are gone, I'll take refuge in you. I call to God the Most High, to God. He's directing his petition, not to man, not to somebody else, but to the Most High God, El Elyon. And he's then acknowledging what God's doing, who is accomplishing his purpose for me. Yes. God's, David's in God's army. And he, he's trusting God because he believes that God is accomplishing God's purpose in him. Now, if this is for you, you can say the same thing, that I'm walking in this world to accomplish with God's help. He will send from heaven and save me. He will send from heaven and save me. From what? When those who, when those who would trample me down mock me? Selah. You see Selah in the scriptures a lot. Anybody know what Selah means? Stop. Stop. Think about it. Marinate it. Let it become a part of you. What is, what is he saying? David is believing that God will send from heaven and save him. From what? From those who would trample me down and mock me. Or kill me. Saul and his army are after me. I don't see anything that I can trust except my God. God will send his grace and truth. Last time I checked, that was on the logo. For a reason. They're just the two pillars of God. His grace, his truth. And then here we go back into the context. I'm surrounded by lions. I'm lying down among the people, breathing fire. Men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongues sharp-edged swords. It's a reality. David's got an enemy. David's got an enemy. But he's got a God that he trusts. In verse 5, Be exalted, God, above heaven. May your glory be over all the earth. Be exalted above heaven. Wow. Heaven's pretty high, right? And David is acknowledging that God deserves to be exalted even above heaven. They prepare to snare for my feet, but I'm bending over to avoid it. They dug a pit ahead of me. But, they fell into it themselves. <laughs> Selah. Think about that. Your enemies' swords are going to be turned upon your enemies. 
My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is fixed. In the Hebrew, it's the word kun. My heart is fixed. Steadfast, fixed. And because it's fixed, I will sing and make music in the midst of everything that was going on. In the midst of everything that was going on. I will sing and make music. And then he's talking next, he's next, he's talking to himself. Awake, my glory, everything that's about me, my glory. Awake, lyre and lute, my abilities to make music. I will awaken the, I will awaken the dawn. I'll wake them up with my praise to God. In the midst of everything I'm going through, I'm praising God. I can remember the first time I was in a, in a turmoil and somebody said, well, praise the Lord. I'm going like, I don't feel like praising the Lord. Well, praise the Lord anyway. In the midst of everything you're going through, you're acknowledging God. You're acknowledging God and acknowledging that you're walking out His purposes and He'll be there with you. I will thank you, Adonai, among the peoples. I will make music. I will sing to you among the nations, and the nations will hear me singing to you. For your grace is great all the way to heaven, your truth all the way to the skies. And then he says it again. Be exalted, God, above heaven. May your glory be over all the earth. I mean, let that be our prayer and praise that that's what we're here for, is to praise God, to acknowledge God in the good times and in the bad, in the sad and the lonely and the high mountaintop places. Anybody can praise God on a mountaintop. But realizing that He is with you everywhere you go, through the valleys, Yea, though I walk through the valley. We will have valleys. But we have a God that's with us in all these times. Father, we thank you so much for the truth that you have left us to share in your word. We thank you so much that you continue to work in our lives and make us more and more like your son, Yeshua. Father, we just invite you and your spirit into this place this morning because we want to acknowledge you as the King of our kings, the Lord of lords, that your son and his shed blood are the reason why we can have fellowship with you. We praise you and bless you. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.